Hello again and welcome to another episode of the Ominous Origins Podcast with me, Casey. Of course, this episode is still brought to you by the wonderful people over at MorbidlyBeautiful.com. Go check out Morbidly Beautiful right now for all your horror pop culture needs from reviews, interviews, top 10 lists, and everything in between. They have a great library of podcasts as well, which I highly suggest checking out after you finish up with this episode here. Now, today's episode, the day after Halloween, I know I missed Halloween, I wanted to do something special for Halloween, but I couldn't find the right thing, so I thought it would just be better to leave it and do something the next day. Logic, illogic, who knows? That's the way my brain works. Live with it. But I do have a very weird one for you today. We're going the true crime route, and nothing is more strange than true life. People are capable of the weirdest, most terrifying, heinous things on the planet. And today we have a guy right out of a horror movie. This is the story of the Beast of Jersey, also known as Edward Paisnell. Ominous. Ominous. It is an adjective. Sounds like someone breathing. All right, so I want you to picture something for me right now in your brain. What is maybe the most iconic mask in horror history? Well, you're surely going to think of the hockey mask from Jason, or maybe even Michael Myers' William Shatner mask. But what's even more terrifying than that? Well, how about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre face mask of actual faces? Yep, we're looking at you, Ed Gein. But we're not looking at you, Ed Gein, today. Maybe another day. No, today we're looking at, like I said, Edward Paisnell. And he, well, he's a thing out of nightmares. I'm looking at a picture of him right now, and this character is terrifying. Now, while the mask he wore was not actual human flesh, it did resemble it. Now, I should mention that Paisnell was active in the 60s and early 70s. So, just kind of picture very old, ill-fitting masks. And I believe it looked like a woman as well. Very Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3 looking kind of face mask thing going on. He was not a good dude. Let's just put it that way. His outfit was also completed with a nail studded wristlet and collar. And it looks as though, based on the pictures I've seen, that some of the nails even go through his lapel and down where the buttons should be. All in all, this is a terrifying individual, hence the name, the Beast of Jersey. But we're not talking about New Jersey in the United States, we're talking about the very small island of Jersey, or Isle of Jersey, I'm not sure which it is. Regardless, the entire place is smaller than the greater London region. It is only 9 miles wide by 5 miles long, and it is technically part of the sovereign state of the United Kingdom, and it sits in a channel between England and France. In the 1950s, its population was just over 30,000 inhabitants. Now, it all started in 1957. A nurse was waiting for a bus in the mont a labbe I'm not sure if I said that right, but we'll go with that, area of the island. Dressed in a long coat and a scarf over his face, a man approached her and beat her over the head. He tied a rope around her neck and sexually assaulted her in a nearby field. She was severely injured during the attack and needed stitches. However, she was discovered and taken to the hospital where she recovered from her physical wounds. Of course, you never really fully recover from that emotionally or mentally, so that's when it all started right then and there in 19. Fifty-seven, But things don't really go crazy for a little while just yet. The man later attacked a 20-year-old in March of 1957 who was walking home from the bus stop near Trinity. He used the same method with her, pulled her into a field by her neck, and assaulted her as well. And in July, he attacked a 31-year-old and then a 28-year-old in St. Martin's in October of 1959. After the attacks, the victims gave their statements to the police, and all of them had repetitive themes. 
They all confirmed that the man was around 5'6 in his mid-40s and had a strange Irish accent that they believed was fake. Makes sense. They also described him as a musty-smelling gentleman. It's safe to say he wasn't actually a gentleman, though. Police agreed that the same man had attacked all three, and he became known in the press as the Beast of Jersey. But little did they know, things were about to heat up. In 1960, he got a little braver, and he changed his attack plan and began breaking into houses and assaulting people in their homes instead of on the streets. This meant no one was safe. On Valentine's Day of 1960, the Beast of Jersey climbed through the window of a house and into an upstairs bedroom. The boy whose room he entered was only 12 years old. When he woke up, he saw the man in a mask standing at the foot of his bed, holding a torch to his face, blinding him. Now, torch is a British term for flashlight, just in case we have any confusion. It wasn't actually like fire on a stick, I don't think. The man placed a rope around this poor boy's neck and took him outside to a field where he raped him. When the assault was over, the man led the boy back to his house and disappeared. I don't know if that's worse than killing him or not. He treated him like a dog, a bad dog, an unloved dog. Just pure animalistic in this guy's behavior and the way he treats people as well. Now in March, a woman walking to a bus stop in St. Berlade stopped to speak to a man who had stopped his car and offered her a lift. He said he was a doctor who was on his way to pick up his wife, which we all know is a likely story. See, that's the equivalent of don't take candy from a van. As a kid, don't get into a car with somebody who claims they're a doctor or have a wife because they probably don't. And they are most certainly not a doctor. When she turned to speak to the man, she realized that he was wearing a big overcoat, hat, and gloves. Now, back in the 60s, you may not recognize that as anything overly suspicious. It's probably pretty close to the style back then. But today, if you saw a man in an overcoat at all, you're walking the other way because chances are he's going to flash you at the very least. This poor woman could not see his face. And when she understood the mistake she'd made, he had already driven them to a secluded part of the island, which is probably pretty tough given the size of the place. It's not very big, but it is very rural, so... I guess most of it is probably secluded to some degree. Once in the field, he began to beat the woman, punching her hard in the face, and then he tied her hands behind her back. Then he led her out into the field, where he parked. Once he had finished sexually assaulting her, he led her back to the car, and the pair drove off. Realizing that this was her chance to escape, the woman jumped out of the moving vehicle and began to scream. Panicked by the noise, the man sped up and was never tracked down. Again, coward. Later that month, a 43-year-old woman and her 14-year-old daughter were asleep in their cottage in a remote part of the island in St. Martin's. The mother was awoken after midnight to the phone ringing downstairs. She got out of bed to answer it, but there was silence on the other end, followed by a click and then the timely dial tone. Assuming it was a wrong number, she simply just went back to bed. A while later, she was awoken again by a noise. She went downstairs to investigate, turning on the lights to see better. When she reached the bottom step, the lights went out. And that's when she realized she was no longer alone. There was someone in the living room. So she picked up the phone to call the police, but the line was dead. Whoever this man was, the Beast of Jersey, had cut the phone line. Now, this is a terrifying picture. Just put yourself in this situation for the briefest of moments. Your heart's pounding. The lights around you just turned off. You know you're not alone. And then you look over and see a shadowy figure standing in a room just off to your side. After a second, the shadow begins to move, not at a slow lumbering pace, but at full speed towards you. The man demanded money and threatened to kill her. In the struggle, her daughter awoke to hear the noise and went to see what was going on. Once he saw the young girl, the man let go of the woman and lunged up the stairs to the daughter. The woman, now free, ran to her neighbor's home and brought them back to the cottage to catch the intruder. But naturally, in true horror movie fashion, when they arrived, they found the daughter alone. She had already been tied up and raped. But at least she survived. 
In April, a 14-year-old girl was awoken by a man in her bedroom, watching her as she slept. She began to scream in the hopes of waking her sleeping parents, and it worked. So the man fled. Coward. In July, the same year, an 8-year-old boy was kidnapped from his home. He had a rope tied around his neck and was led into a nearby field where he was raped, just like the first boy. After the assault, he was taken back to his home and delivered right to his doorstep. This would be the last assault of the year. Investigators soon realized that the Beast of Jersey had to be a resident of the island due to the frequency of the attacks and knowing the geography and the layout. They began to interview every man who had a criminal record, but none of them fit the description of the victims. Officers also requested fingerprints from all the adult males on the island. They had a right to refuse, and 13 of them did. One of them was the masked man. I mean, that's the best way to do it. You don't even really have to check the fingerprints of the ones you got, because those guys probably didn't do it. It does, however, really narrow down the field. If there's a thousand men on this island, and at the time there's a population of 30,000, so you can assume at least 12 to 15,000 of them are men, well, you just look at the 13 who didn't. There's your suspect pool right there. Of course, there was eventually a break in the case. Now, Jersey police eventually arrested Alphonse Le Gastelois for the attacks and rapes. He was known as a strange fisherman who lived on the island. The police were grasping at straws and any eccentric characters needed to be looked into. However, he was released after 14 hours of questioning due to lack of evidence. But the damage had been done. His name had been given to the press, and his picture was all over the local news. In true Frankenstein fashion, an angry mob burned down his house. Poor Alphonse was forced to flee, and he ended up on a group of islands northeast of Jersey. However, he did live a full life and died in 2012 at the age of 97. In February of 1961, the attacks began again, but this time... The Beast of Jersey's pattern changed again. And instead of attacking different generations, he targeted children solely. And by April, three young children had been taken from their homes and attacked. The police on the small island were unfortunately ill-equipped to handle such an investigation. They really didn't know what to do next, and so they called in Scotland Yard to help with the investigation. Scotland Yard told the residents that they need to start looking out for each other and set up neighborhood watches to keep each other safe. They also created a profile of the attacker from the descriptions made by the victims. It goes as such. 45 years old and approximately 5'6 in height with a medium build. He knew the island well, especially the east coast. He had a mustache but covered his face either with a scarf or mask during the attacks. He wore a long, dark, musty coat a hat, and a pair of gloves. He entered homes through bedroom windows using the moonlight as his sole source of illumination between 10 p.m. and 3 a.m., and he carried a torch, a.k.a. a flashlight. Despite the profile, investigators hit a dead end, and another dead end, and another dead end, and then eventually the attacks stopped for a few years. It wasn't until two years later, in April of 1963, that a nine-year-old boy was the next victim of the masked man. He was taken from his home to a field with a rope around his neck and sodomized, just like the others. As before, with the other victims, he was brought home again after the attack. In November, the same thing happened to an 11-year-old boy, and in 1964, during July and August, a 10-year-old girl and boy of the same age were attacked in their homes too. For the next two years, the Beast of Jersey stayed in the shadows, and life went on as usual. Finally, neighborhoods began to calm their self-policing, and it appeared that the attacks were over for good. But we all know they weren't. In 1966, the police received a letter from the Beast. It says, quote, Dear Sir, I think that it is just the time to tell you that you are just wasting your time, as every time I have done what... I always intended to do, and remember, it will not stop at this. But I will be fair to you and give you a chance. I have never had much out of this life, but I intend to get everything I can now. I have always wanted to do the perfect crime. I have done this. 
but this time, let the moon shine very brittle in September because this time, it must be perfect. Not one, but two. I am not a maniac by a long shot, but I like to play with you people. You will hear from me before September, and I will give you all the clues. Just see if you can catch me. Yours very sincerely, wait and see. In August, a 15-year-old girl was brutally assaulted in her home, but the attack was different this time. The girl's body was covered in long scratches that were perfectly dispersed in parallel lines. After this attack, there were no more incidents for four years. In August of 1970, the beast returned. A 14-year-old boy awoke from his sleep in Valley de Vaux, home to a torch shining in his face. Again, he was attacked as others were, but this time, he was being led back to his house. The masked man spoke to him. He told the boy to stay quiet because if you don't, someone will harm your mother and father. When the boy's parents found him, he was disheveled and upset, but wouldn't speak of what happened to him. Eventually, he told them and was taken to the hospital, where an examination showed that he too had the scratches down his torso that had covered the girl four years earlier. And in addition, the boy told police that the man had spiky black hair and was wearing a frightening mask. On the 10th of July, 1972, officers cruised around the island on their regular night patrol. It was almost midnight when they stopped at a red light in the St. Helier district when a Morse car ran the stoplight. The officers chased the driver who was trying desperately to get away from them. Unfortunately, he drove on the wrong side of the road and up some embankments and onto the footpaths, but eventually crashed into a hedge and finally stopped in a tomato field. When he got out of the car, he began to run, as did the officers chasing him. He was eventually tackled to the ground and arrested. On the ride to the police headquarters, officers noticed a musty smell coming from the man, and when they finally were under the bright strip light of the station, they saw the man's appearance for the first time. He was wearing a long, dark coat with inch-long nails and screws sticking out of the collar, cuffs, and shoulders. They were what made the marks on the young girl and boy. When they emptied the man's pocket, they found a black torch with tape covering the majority of the glass, so only a pinprick of light would shine through. Two pieces of cord were used for tying up his victims, a wool cap, and duct tape. That is basically what you would call a rape kit today. They also found a spiky black wig and the mask he had been using to terrorize his victims, and yes, it is fucking terrifying. Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna have to put this on Twitter and on Facebook and everything because this guy's fucking nuts. Oh my god. The man in question was Edward Painsell, a 46-year-old born in 1925. He was a family man with a wife and children. He also came from a wealthy family. He didn't have a criminal record, but was imprisoned for a month during World War II by German officers when he stole food for starving families. He played Santa Claus at the children's foster home that his wife worked at, and the kids called him Uncle Ted. And I've just seen a real picture of his face, and the mask is less terrifying than this man's face. I will also post a picture on Twitter and on Facebook about this creepy motherfucker. Little did all these other people know, though, that Edward Painsell had kind of a Jekyll and Hyde life going on. There was a second side to him, including a low sex drive and at least one mistress. And true to form, his wife never suspected a thing, and their marriage appeared to be normal. When the police questioned about the outfit he was wearing and why he was speeding, he told investigators that he was going to an orgy and didn't want to be recognized. As for the nails, he said that he added those in case he was attacked by someone who knew martial arts. He refused to talk about the mask and wig, which had been worn that night, judging by the marks on his face. Paisnell was remanded in custody and officers were sent to search his home. Once in the house, they found a locked secret room inside of his bedroom. It smelled of must, naturally, and they found old clothing and homemade wigs complete with matching false eyebrows. They discovered a camera and photographs of houses across the island. Investigators believe that he had been planning his attacks for years and had many more lined up. 
When they asked Paisnel about the photographs, he told them he chose his victims years before the crimes. He knew specific details about the families and their homes and knew which windows to climb into on the nights of the assaults. They also found his shrine to Satan, which included an altar, a sword, and an extensive collection of books about black magic and the occult. And no wonder why Satanists get a bad name, even though they're generally pretty cool people. But hey, that's for a different episode. On the 29th of November 1971, it took a jury 38 minutes to find him guilty of 13 counts of rape, indecent assault, and sodomy against six of his victims. He was sentenced to 30 years in Winchester Prison in the UK, but was released in 1991 after 20 years served for good behavior. For some fucked up reason, he tried to move back to Jersey, but due to the reign of terror he held for so many years, he wasn't welcome, obviously, and instead moved to the Isle of Wight. He died three years later from a heart attack in 1994. Good fucking riddance. And I'm going to leave you on a very cheery note that's complete and utter sarcasm because in 2007, a child abuse investigation named Operation Rectangle began, which saw many children in foster care on the island abused for years. In 2008, during a search of Hau de la Garine, I'm probably butchering that, a home that housed up to 60 children at a time, officers found 65 milk teeth in the basement many belonging to older children who have already shed them. They also found shackles under the dirt, which were attached to the walls. Children were abused by staff for a very long time, and it was believed that Edward Paisnell was part of the conspiracy due to his involvement in the foster care system. But police have since confirmed he wasn't part of the inquiry. Though he was only charged for 13 counts, it is believed that he assaulted many many more people than the number who came forward. I hope you enjoyed that episode. My name is Casey, and this is the Ominous Origins Podcast. If you like what you heard, please feel free to leave a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, and any five-star review left will be read out on the show, so if you want to shout out, that is the best way to do it. You can also follow along on Twitter at HorrorShotsProd, as in production, or on Instagram at OminousOriginsPod, or on Facebook at Horror Shots. I've seen a, quite a few new likes on there lately, so I really appreciate the support. So, until next time...